Memoirs of a Dad, narrated by Mark Carroll, Chapter 8. In her classic novel, The Red and the Green, Iris Murdoch states, The bicycle is the most civilised conveyance known to man. Other forms of transport grow daily more nightmarish. Only the bicycle remains pure in heart. Elizabeth West, in Oval in the Hills, waxes even more lyrical. She informs us, when man invented the bicycle, he reached the peak of his attainments. He was a machine of precision and balance for the convenience of man, and, unlike subsequent inventions for man's convenience, the more he used it, the fitter his body became. Here, for once, was a product of man's brain that was entirely beneficial to those who used it, and of no harm or irritation to others. Progress should have stopped when man invented the bicycle. Bill Strickland, on the other hand, in his work The Quotable Cyclist, emphasised the sheer energy efficiency of this unique means of transport, stating, The bicycle is the most efficient machine ever created. Converting calories into gas, a bicycle gets the equivalent of 3,000 miles per gallon. You no doubt, dear listener, will not be surprised when I tell you that I am more or less in agreement with all these statements. However, there are other combinations which I have found important and desirable. The first of these for anybody serious about exploring their own country with limited leisure time available is the combination of bicycle and train. From a British cyclist's point of view, the golden period, with regard to this, was ushered in by our present Queen's Silver Jubilee, to celebrate which British Rail announced that bicycles would in future be transported free of charge. These were the days when passenger trains carried parcels and newspapers, and even boxes of Aberdeen kippers, and had guards vans with adequate space to carry them. People in the south of England were suddenly able to travel to Scotland, cycling to the station of their departure, and from the station at their destination, without the fuss of having to boot their bike in advance, or pay for its transportation. Similarly, we in the north could enjoy a touring holiday in Devon or Cornwall, or some other far-flung place. Lack of space was rarely a problem. That situation did not last long. It began to change long before John Major decided it would be a good idea to privatise the railway system. Suddenly, passenger space became the only space trains should have. Parcels and newspapers had no place on our trains, and space for bicycles should be reduced dramatically. It was, and is, a stupid policy, forcing people to use antisocial forms of transport which are not only unnecessary, but environmentally damaging. The combination of bike, train and ferry opens up even more possibilities, as Tom and myself were to discover in the summer of 1986. Maurice Collins, having convinced me we could afford to go camping in France, decided at the last minute not to go. I still hadn't arranged a passport, and I was initially tempted to call the trip off. However, I had bought maps, and carried out quite a bit of research. Obtaining a passport was not difficult in those days, when we had a right-wing government, which, amongst other pledges, had promised to cut red tape, and make life easier and simpler for all. But I'd not really put those ideas into practice, thank goodness. As a consequence, you could still obtain a temporary visitor's passport from any post office, which allowed you to travel to any part of the European Union. The system was speedy, efficient and cheap. Sooner or later it clearly would have to go. Freedom of movement? You must be joking. But whilst it remained, I could take advantage, and so I did. When we set out, armed with a map of Normandy, my only aim was to find a campsite near Cherbourg and use this as a base to explore that particular region of France. We travelled to Weymouth by train, where we caught an overnight ferry to Cherbourg, arriving about 5.30 in the morning 
when the town was just beginning to wake up. My first priority was to obtain supplies of food. We cycled from the port into the centre of the town, crossing the river Devet by the swing bridge which allows small sea vessels into the old harbour. Here we found a bar catering for locals and open for the provision of coffee and breakfast. I could feel the eyes of Madame behind the counter, scrutinising our cycling garb as she served a man in working clothes. Her dark eyes turned to Tom, now sat at a nearby table, and then I saw her take a quick glance towards the main window. Our tandem leant against it. She turned to me with a smile and a tilt of her head. Bonjour, she said, her eyes now twinkling a message of greeting. I responded in my very poor schoolboy French, and she broke into a rather more advanced schoolgirl English. National barriers collapsed, and soon Tom and I were savouring our first crop madame. We were off to a good start. Language was my bête noire. It takes me all my time to make myself understood in most parts of England, let alone France. However, I had made my first important discovery. The combination of a child and a bike opens many doors in La Belle France, particularly when the parent accompanying the child is a mere male. Tom and I were to return to this friendly bar over and over again. After studying our map, I decided to head east along the coast road to a spot named Lons du Brich. It was a mistake. Despite it being in a beautiful part of the country and on the coast, it was a bit out of my price league. After a couple of nights, we made our way to the west of Cherbourg, where we discovered a municipal site by the name of La Dunes, in the commune of Eureville, Nacaville. This campsite, as its name implies, was right above the beach, and like many of its sisters throughout France, was as cheap as pommes frites. The French love camping, and cater extensively for those who do. Municipal campsites can be found all over the country, most are simple, and all are relatively cheap. From La Dunes, we set out on a different route each day, sometimes treating ourselves to breakfast in the Cherbourg bar, and sometimes returning there in the evening for a light snack or meal and a few drinks. Normandy is blessed with a rugged and hilly sea coast, and is crisscrossed by a network of quiet country lanes serving small communes and farms. My kind of country, where one minute you're sweating up a steep hill, and next minute descending at full pelt, building up momentum to assist your progress over the next summit. Very quickly, we made our second great discovery. Unlike a large number of British motorists, who seem to have a brain connected to their car's ignition, by which I mean the ignition key not only switches on the engine, but simultaneously switches off that part of the brain which has any empathy with other road users. French drivers have and show a great deal of respect for the safety of cyclists. They are quite content on a narrow lane, for example, to remain behind you until they can overtake with a wide margin between car and bike, and when they do overtake, they invariably wave, and I don't mean with a two or even single finger salute. Later on, we were to discover this also applied in other countries. It seems it is British drivers in particular who are the ones out of step. We lived on fresh fruit and cheese, both cow and goats, tin mackerel and cassoulet, sausages and pâté, and fresh newly baked bread of a quality and taste that had disappeared from England when the giant factory bakeries producing sliced plastic destroyed our country's excellent local bakeries during the last years of my childhood. I budgeted to live on £10 a day, including our camping fees, and the budget proved more than adequate for our needs. The weather remained good throughout, the worst being the occasional damp fret blowing in from the channel. This was the last summer holiday we would have before Tom started school, and as a result we'd been able to travel in early mid-July. 
One day, Bastille Day, the 14th of July, as it happened, I decided to visit Valogne, an inland town some 20 kilometres southeast of Cherbourg. A criterium, that is a town centre bike race, was taking place there early in the evening as part of that day's celebrations. Everything went smoothly. The race was exciting, and Tom and myself were able to obtain a good place to enjoy it, not far from the finishing line, and, as was not uncommon, our tandem drew many admiring glances. The race was followed by the prize presentations and a firework display to round off the evening. We cycled back to Cherbourg, along a road that was mainly downhill, and once more called in at our favourite bar. I gave Tom some coins to feed the jukebox, and ordered a large beer for myself, and the inevitable coke for him, before we cycled the last few kilometres to our tent by the beach. Again our story has to end, unfortunately. We decided to ride into Cherbourg, and to spend the last evening in the bar, but when we arrived it was closed. Neither Tom nor I were happy at this sad state of affairs. We had wanted to say au revoir to Madame and her customers, who had made us feel so welcome, virtually from the moment we had first set foot on French soil. We stood by the quay opposite, watching a few fishing boats enter the harbour, as I wondered what to do next. Then a piercing whistle. We looked towards the bar. Somebody stood in the doorway, beckoning to us. We were swiftly crossing the road and placing the tandem by the window. We soon learned the small back room contained the crew of a yacht taking part in a regatta. Drunken English, we were informed. We locked up to keep others out. Je suis anglais, I pointed out. Madame came over with a large beer for me and a coke for Tom. Mais non, she said, shaking her head. You are one of us, Malcolm. She provided Tom with a pile of coins for the jukebox, and after some time, when we were about to take our leave, a dock worker, whose acquaintance we'd made during the week, stepped forward with a newspaper. For Tom, he explained, opening the centre pages. They were devoted to the cycle race at Valonia, and slap bang in the centre was a photograph of part of the crowd, the main character featured being Tom, watching the finish, held high in my arms. Thus ended our first trip to Normandy, and our first encounter with the French. It would not be the last.